Uh, yeah, I can't share my screen. Why not? I won't let you on the app, the link. I'm on the link, but I'm not the host, so. Okay, maybe send the maybe send the slides to him then. I have. I've sent the PDF and also invited him. Okay. To the Google slides. Okay. No. Hello. Oh, you're right, guys. Hello. Yeah. Uh, how are you both? Yeah, good. Thank you. How are you? We're good. Thank you. Good. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen. I've suddenly become like 60 years old, and it's not letting me. Um, so I just. Open. <laughs> it's all part of the fun. Yeah, to work yeah. yeah, yeah. If it's not technical problems, then it's not. Then it's not a webinar, is it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say I just need to quit and reopen. Yeah. Wonderful. Can you all can you all see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Nice. Okay. Cool. Um, shall we wait until five minutes past, and then we can get started? We'll just let, give people a chance to join.
I don't know. It's easier for us to share it in a PDF form rather than in, I mean, uh, PowerPoint form rather than in a PDF, maybe. Might look um, a bit better. Yeah, 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 we can try. I mean, uh, Google, uh, like, slides would probably be best. Yeah, that's what, that's what we've got, actually, yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, Morgan's, Morgan, Morgan was, share, was going to share it. Okay, wonderful. I'll stop sharing this for a second. Can you see that? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. I can still see Ben's screen at the moment. One second, let me try and get it off. Um. Is that any help? Yeah. Sorry, well, you're on mute. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, guys. All right, should we get started? Yeah, sounds okay. sounds good. Take it away. Um, nice. Yeah, I thought I'd just um, start by introducing myself. Um, so I'm Will uh, from Clamato, um, head of partnerships here in the UK, um, and kind of joined by um, Vic, who's our kind of head of our science team, uh, LCA manager, and um, I don't know, Vic, do you want to give a quick introduction to yourself? Yes, thank you, Will. Uh, I'm Victoria, or Vic in short, uh, uh, representing the science team at Climato, and as Will said, I'm the uh, LCA manager based in uh, Stockholm, in Sweden. Nice. So yeah, about today, it's probably big. Um, um, good to see. Oh, what's going on there? <laughs> um, just good to give a bit of background about um, who we are, what we're doing, um, and how we kind of work with um, food service businesses and hospitality industry um, to help them to kind of reduce, uh, calculate, and report on their emissions. Um, we then want to go and talk a bit about um, things that you should know about ingredients. And Vic's going to talk some really interesting stuff about um, what kind of typical ingredients make up a high carbon footprint was a lower carbon footprint and how you can look at making easy swaps within that in that area um and then we also want to look at kind of what how you can kind of use uh, pr and other marketing activities to um alongside your sustainability initiatives to kind of make that benefits to your business and then we have a few time for some questions at the end hopefully is the is the plan uh, so we go to the next slide i thought i'd start by telling a bit about clamato um so we we were founded um about three three and a half years ago um with the ambition of help trying to make the food industry more transparent um in the past uh, it was very costly um to find out information about life cycle assessments and about information regarding the carbon footprint of food um we wanted to try and make a tool which could make people really understand the impact of food um in an easy and easy to use way um we we were started by four childhood friends um, from a kind of a university project. Um, and now we've been operating in, in Scandinavia. Uh, we opened in the UK in September last year. Um, and we now operate across the whole of Europe. We've also now opened um, small little branches in Hong Kong and UAE, our first customers over there now as well. So it's been quite a, quite a journey since um, that initial university project. Um, and one thing we're really happy to, to say is that last year, um, our customers reduced their emissions by about 14.6%. Um, so we know that what we're doing is working, um, but we want to bring more and more companies on board with this, with this journey and help them to also reduce their emissions um, in line with kind of UN recommendations. So, yeah, so what's a bit more about what we do um, and why we're doing it? Um, the food industry currently creates for about 30% about or about 28 to 35%, depending on how you look at it, um, for total global greenhouse gases. Um, to put, that, to put some facts around that, um, you know, cows, for example, 
uh, make up almost the same amount of emissions as the, to the, to the whole of America. Um, so, you know, it's it's a crazy, a crazy fact um, and something which I think a lot, of, a lot of people aren't aware of. For example, last year at COP26, food wasn't even on the agenda for, for climate change, um, despite it being so, so high in this total greenhouse gas emissions um, factor. So we want to try and make that more obvious to people so people can understand the impact of what they're eating um, and, they, and what their choices have. At the same time, we are seeing that customers do want that information um, and do want to eat more climate friendly. Um, a lot more people now are identifying as flexitarian or kind of trying to cut down meat one day a week or whatever that, whatever that is. People are now are knowing that they want to do this, but still haven't always got the information on how to do that. We're also seeing the government and, bus and businesses now setting net zero targets and try to push towards having a more kind of accountability for the for the food and the climate um, goals. Um, hopefully, more will be done on this. I think you know we've all seen the last six to nine months in the UK has been a slightly uh, tumultuous time where <laughs> um, you know things have changed almost daily. But as we go forward, we're hoping that the UK, as other countries are doing, will set more targets around climate labelling, um, and this will become an industry standard in the same way that calories have rightly or wrongly become in the last um in the last year uh just go to the next slide so i think you probably don't need me to, to talk about the challenges too much in the industry right now but obviously seeing um rising costs with inflation and with price of goods um, coming from places like ukraine um at the same time cost of living crisis with a predicted recession in the uk uh, to come over the next couple of years um, and it's really important i think to try and look for any every way that can kind of feature proof your business from this um, and try and attract more staff and encourage you know more um, longer supply chains and look at where you're sourcing ingredients from so how how we can kind of help you do this and help help businesses do this we found that having more vegetarian options on the menu and in, in, and, in, and in turn more climate friendly options on the menu can also reduce your costs so we worked with um, with one of our partners Sodexo um, and found that their climate friendly options were actually tend to be about 63% cheaper than their um, meat alternatives or their less climate friendly options. Um, so just by adding a few more of those to your menu or by tweaking the menu slightly and the, and the, ingress, the recipe slightly to add maybe slightly more you know, lentils to a bit of beef burger or um, adding slightly more vegetables to a dish can actually reduce the, the costs to there. Alongside this, I found staff really want to work for a more ethical business. And, you know, it's IBM survey found that about 68% of um, people surveyed wanted to work for a more sustainable company. And that was something they looked for when actually um, looking for a company to work for. But also, this vegans tend to actually be one of the wealthier demographics in terms of eating out. And the average meal was about 37.55, uh, 37 pounds 55. That's a strange way of saying it. Pounds for a meal, for a meal out. Um, whereas, you know, people without those dietary requirements tend to have a much lower income and much lower um dietary much lower basket total basket um, so that's an important thing to look out for um and then not only that but also by serving more by serving more climate friendly meals these tend to be also more nutritious um the, the guardian i think i saw the article the other day recommended that we eat about 30 different plants weekly which sounds like a lot but when it comes to just trying to add more a couple of more dishes to your couple of more vegetarian dishes to the menus or a couple more ingredients into each different dish you're really going to be helping society as a whole to have more nutritious meals and lastly not only that but it's just about doing the right thing for the planet um and, it, and by doing that you know people are saying that as i said before people want to make those more sustainable choices um but don't know how to do it so having the common labels on the menus gives them that easy option of seeing how to eat more sustainably So how does our how does our tool work? So we have a an online tool um, where you can easily go in, add your different recipes. So it works. We look at the for each different ingredient. We have done a life cycle assessment. So we've looked at the production method. So if we're looking at something like beef, we've looked at how is that beef farmed? Is it land fed? Is it fed kind of rapeseed? And where does that come from in each different country? What's a typical methodology? Um, we've also broken that down by organic or conventionally farmed produce. Um, we then look at the processing. So, for example, with beef, how is that um, slaughtered, or how is it then turned into into mints, for example? And lastly, we then look at transport. So, how, how is it coming from 
Spain to, to, to the UK, or has it just come locally? And that all makes up the total carbon footprint. So as you go along, you can put those different ingredients into the tool and you'll get a total carbon footprint to that ingredient and in real time see what swap you can make to make it more climate friendly. As I mentioned before, a lot of people want to be more climate friendly, but don't really know what that means. So we want to work with you to try and make sure it's easy to communicate it. The first part of that is obviously the labels on the menus where people can easily see what they're eating. But we also realize that different companies and different restaurants want to do things in their own brand specific way. So we want to work with you to kind of use your own tone of voice, talk to your customers about why it's important and why it's important to them. Um, so we have an in-house marketing team who work with you on that to make it more transparent and more obvious in what you're doing. And lastly, it's amazing how many businesses have great ambitious goals in terms of, you know, they want to reduce their carbon footprint or they want to be net zero by 2030, but actually don't know what their current emissions are, uh, which is always, always surprises me. But that's why we've got our reporting tool so you can track your emissions where they are now, set targets and actually track it month on month in terms of where you're at and where you want to go. Um, and all of this has been done in line with the UN and WWF. So they, what they WWF recommends is that for a, a weekly budget of 11 kilograms of CO2E, CO2E, CO2E stands for carbon dioxide equivalents. So stuff like methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. I'll let that go into a bit more detail on that. Um, but in order to try and hit the Paris Agreement, that 1.5 degree um, increase, they recommend we eat about 11 kilograms of CO2E per week. This equates to roughly about 0 0.5 per main meal, so whether that be lunch and dinner. Um, and so every dish under 0 0.5 would classed as a low dish. And I think on the next slide, I'll just quickly show you what the different labels look like. Oh no, maybe not. <laughs> uh, that's, we'll come to that one. Um, so our database has been taken using, using those values and specifically de developed for the UK market. So the amazing science team that we have put together these um, this, da this database where each different ingredient has a, has a carbon footprint value. Um, and like I said, it's based on that, those processing, um, production and transportation. And we use peer reviewed articles and academic literature to find those, find those find that data. And then we, we kind of use our own in-house team to kind of do models around that. And this has all been certified by the IBL, which is the oldest environmental institute in Europe. And this is what I was trying to say a second ago. So these are different labels, uh, as you can see, what we try and do is not um, have traffic light systems whereby we're putting people off. It's more about trying to just inform people of what, they, they, what they're eating. So we, we initially started when we had traffic light system and red kind of put people off. So we thought, let's have these different green colors. Um, and the medium is anything less than the UK average today, which is about 1.6. So anything less than that, we glass to the medium dish. Anything over that is a high dish. Over to Vic. Thank you, Will. Uh, here we will go more into uh, more science-based uh, 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 information that uh, we think it's important to know when we calculate the carbon footprint uh, of different food products. And this is how our data are developed. Our data are based on life cycle analysis. And that's what the title is about. What is an LCA? What is a life cycle analysis? Life cycle analysis is a methodology is an ISO 140 and 144 standardized methodology for uh, calculating uh, environmental impacts of uh, various products, including, of course, food products. Also, uh, our values are based on ISO 14067. It's another stand ISO standardized methodology for calculating specifically the carbon footprint um, uh, impact the, the carbon footprint of uh, products and services and activities, of course. These are the most accepted methods among the scientific community for quantifying environmental uh, impacts and specifically uh, carbon footprint. The life cycle methodology, as you can see on the uh, right uh, picture, it's a methodology that assesses the greenhouse gas emissions of a product during its life cycle stage. On the right picture, we see the life cycle of a food product starting, starting from agricultural production and ending up in waste. Life cycle analysis is uh, calculating, is quantifying uh, the emissions of its life cycle, life cycle stage of the entire food production and the carbon footprint 
is the sum of the greenhouse gas emissions from all the activities and all the stages during the food's life, life uh, cycle. Uh, in each uh, stage, the different activities and the different inputs are translated into emissions. So usually the user or the information that uh, um, someone gets from food producers or from the supply chain in order to calculate these emissions are in the form of materials, in the form of processes, for example, energy consumption. And all this information are translated into uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 uh, equivalents, as we mentioned before. Um, we move to the next slide. Then we go more specifically for the carbon footprint of an ingredient. Climato is calculating the carbon footprint of food ingredients from farm up to the regional distribution center. Uh, the, thing that, the, the factors that can affect the carbon footprint of a food product are the ones that you, uh, the, four, the four most important ones are the ones that you uh, see here. So food products and especially food categories, they emit different amounts of greenhouse gas emissions depending on method of production, country of origin, food miles, and seasonal slash uh, local production. Uh, the, for the first one, method of production, we have uh, the most common distinction is between organic and conventional agriculture. Uh, by applying the one or the other method, we can have differences in terms of uh, the climate impact of a product and the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that it emits in the atmosphere. Uh, maybe the differences are not that big, but uh, during the entire life cycle stages, uh, life cycle stage of a food product, we can see how different uh, production methods have actually an effect on when and how these emissions take place. Then we have country of origin. This relates a lot to, uh, I will give an example, when a food is consumed in the UK, but is produced outside Europe or even within Europe, this also plays an important factor because we have some distance that needs to be covered between the country of origin and the country of consumption. And of course, another important uh, factor when it comes to where the food is produced is uh, country specific uh, 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 differences like the energy mix of a country. Food production is uh, based on uh, energy uh, as well. So if a country has, uh, for example, uh, an energy mix with high fossil fuel content, uh, that will also affect the greenhouse gas emissions of food production, especially within the food uh, processing stage. Food miles, another very interesting topic, and there are many, uh, many different opinions regarding this. Food miles, uh, they, uh, um, they refer to the emissions from uh, transportation. In most of the times, emissions from transportation account for a relatively small amount of an ingredient's uh, carbon footprint if we look at the entire food production system. Uh, so it's usually the production stage that uh, has most of that emits most of the emissions, agriculture, animal farming, food miles are usually less. However, when uh, food transportation is happening, is I'm sorry, taking place by plane, then uh, transportation can be a hotspot. However, thankfully, it is not um, very common to transport foods uh, through uh, airplane. So this uh, is a it's a it's a case that we see less often. And then we have seasonal seasonal over local. Um, for many years, it was believed that locally produced is always the best uh, option when it comes to reducing uh, the carbon footprint from food production. Yes, it is, but only when it's combined with seasonal. So seasonal and local is the ideal. If we have to change between two, always choose uh, the seasonal products because uh, locally produced, especially in uh, 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 more cold climates, uh, means that uh, most of these fruit and vegetables have been grown in greenhouses with the use of electricity. And uh, additionally, if the electricity mix is high in fossil fuel contents, this raises the carbon footprint of a food product uh, a lot. And in general, it uh, raises 
it increases the greenhouse gas emissions of food production a lot. Uh, and if we combine it with the previous step that uh, food transportation is does not emit so high so much high emissions then it's better to uh, use to uh, to buy seasonal even if they are from an other country than uh, buying local from a greenhouse and we can move to the next this is um, a simplified uh, guide on which ingredients have a high carbon footprint and uh, lead um, uh, to um, uh, high, high greenhouse gas emissions. Probably most of you are aware that uh, beef, lamb and goat meat, uh, they emit a lot of methane in the atmosphere from their di digestive system. And here we have a lot of emissions, 21 to 35 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of meat. So by far the biggest reason for uh, these high emissions in this food category comes from the animals, from the methane emissions, as I mentioned before. And then there is an also another part that relates to emissions from land use uh, change. Then uh, as a second, uh, uh, second category with very uh, high uh, greenhouse gas emissions is uh, chicken and pork. The second highest, however, however, with much difference compared to the first category that we talked about, beef, lamb, and goat. Uh, here we have three to six, depends, maybe can go a little bit lower, a little bit higher, depending on the system boundaries that we're using. Three to six kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of meat, and most of the emissions are coming from um, uh, feed production. Dairy and milk, this relates a lot to uh, the first stage because we talk about uh, um, uh, dairy and milk it comes from cows and they belong to the uh, beef category. So a lot of emissions due to methane and land use chains. Uh, so most emissions are coming from animal farming, milk and yogurt, since they have a lower content in milk, they have between one to 1.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per uh, kilogram of um, yogurt or milk and cheese cheese can vary a little bit depending on the milk content and on the processing method uh, cheese between 2 to 10 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of cheese another very interesting category is fish and seafood here uh, the CO2 values can vary a lot because it depends whether the, fi the fish is uh, grown in a farm or they are caught uh, in the open sea so the usual suspects in this category are feed production for farmed fish and fuel consumption for the fishing boat uh, when fish is caught in the open sea. Finally, we have uh, the uh, fifth uh, category. It's a more special case, rice. Um, here, I just want to point out that most grains do not have high emissions. Uh, pasta, uh, wheat, bulgur, they do not have high emissions. Are usually pretty low. However, rice is a little bit more of a special case because usually medium it has a medium CO2 uh, equivalent uh, climate impact. Higher than other grains though, between two to three kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of rice and the emissions, which are methane emissions, are coming from uh, flooded rice fields. Uh, huge amounts of water in those fields they prevent oxygen from actually penetrating the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the soil, and this creates uh, the perfect condition for bacteria grow uh, that can lead to uh, methane emissions. Mm, okay. Nice. Uh, now, what are some of our suggestions on how to incorporate more plant-based into your diet? In gen we have four suggestions here, but in general, what we always say is try to have uh, as much plant-based uh, food options on your table as possible. Uh, if this is not uh, possible, uh, then there are also nice ingredient swaps that uh, uh, food consumers can do to, to also significantly reduce their climate impact. For example, reduce beef in recipes by doing half beef, half pork, as we said before, uh, pork has a lower climate impact than beef, significantly lower climate impact than beef. 
Uh, and one example that uh, we took from, uh, from the Climato tool is we calculated the climate impact of a beef burger, and this is around 3.3 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. Uh, but if you have the quantity of beef with pork, we cal our calculations led, that, led us to two kilograms of CO2 equivalents, which is a significant difference, especially if it's a restaurant that produces a lot of um, beef burgers. Lentils and re legumes to replace meat. This is both an environmental and um, um, we we're not experts definitely, but we believe that it's also from a health perspective, uh, a win-to-win -win, uh, situation. Replacing uh, red meat with lentils and legumes uh, reduces significantly the carbon footprint of a meal and also is a more healthy option. One example, again, from our tool, Separate Spy, which the basic ingredients are milk, lump, and butter, is uh, four kilograms of CO2 equivalents per portion. And a vegan Separate Spy with oat milk, lentils, and nutritional yeast, only 0 0.7 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. Big difference. Uh, another very interesting uh, example, it's a uh, passive cooking of uh, pasta. Uh, inspired by our Italian colleague, Gioia. The carbon footprint of pasta is pretty low uh, in general. So um, the pasta that we buy from the supermarket usually has a low carbon footprint. It belongs to the grains category. However, when we cook it, because we have to boil a big amount of water for a significant amount of time, then the use phase, it increases the carbon footprint of pasta and can actually reach up to two kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of pasta, which is a lot for a pasta dish. The passive cooking tells us that uh, uh, if we follow it, we can reduce our carbon footprint by 80%. The secret here is uh, keep the heat on only for the first two minutes of cooking. And after that, for the rest of the time, that heat can be turned off while keeping the lid on the pot. So practically, we're not using any heat. We let the pasta uh, cook with the uh, boiled water. And uh, this has the potential to reduce the carbon footprint of a pasta dish by 80%, uh, which is definitely very significant. And of course, uh, since uh, with, uh, with vegetarian and vegan recipes, there are a lot of varieties when it comes to ingredients. Our suggestion is also to look for dishes that are, are already vegetarian and experiment with new flavors, new ingredients, and new recipes. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I can. I, I've tried a couple of these. Uh, the uh, the passive cooking, you know, it does work works very well. So I can I can recommend trying to do that. Um, yeah, before we just uh, talk a bit about who we work with and some of the benefits that they found from working with us um so we now work with you know every i'd say most different sectors over in the uk um from, from universities um to to restaurants to airline industry um to contract caterers um to sports to sports teams like uh, man united so what we try to do is in different areas is make sure that we we provide support in, in the way that they need them um, for example, with Levy UK, where we now work across um, all the different 49 different sports venues that they operate um, in some of them, for example, with a Billie Eilish gig um, where they were a lot of her fans tend to be more vegan. We did 100 percent vegan menu with them um, and actually found that food sales are up 45 percent. Um, so it's amazing that you know when you provide those options, people will will come and eat them. Obviously, making sure that you're lining that up with your the demographic and the people you are trying to talk to there. Uh, we've been working with Oaxaca um, since about this time last year. Uh, they were very keen to implement um, carbon labels onto the menus, and I'll kind of show a bit more about that in a second, um, what we've done with them. Um, but they're obviously one of the most sustainable businesses and restaurants over here in the UK. Um, and lastly, with hotels as well. So in Courtyard Marriott, they've been using our tool to try and get more corporate customers in particular. So labeling their menus, doing that for events, showing exactly what the benefits are and saying to, to corporate clients, look, if you, want a, if you want a climate friendly menu, these are the different options you can have. And this is how you can reduce your carbon footprint by coming for an event with us, opposed to our competitors. So yeah, just before we go for a few case studies that we've, we've done. So um, with Sodexo, who are a contract caterer and we work with them across 
at the educational sector and also across business industry. Um, and this gives an, a unique opportunity to actually look at how customer behaviors changed um, on a day by day basis as they operate canteens. So we did a survey in one of their AstraZeneca sites and found that actually about 75% of people did pay attention to the labels when making their choices and, and, and did that did tend to mean a more climate friendly meal in general. Um, and since we've been working with them here, like I said, we've, they've reduced their carbon footprint by about 42%, um, which I think is a pretty cool amount, <laughs> um, pretty good. Obviously, there's always more to go, but the UN recommends you know, a reduction yearly of about 7.4% of total greenhouse gases, um, total carbon emissions. Um, and if, you are, if they're a caterer, most of the emissions is going to come from the food they're serving. Um, so that's a, a really great way that they've used our tool. And like I said before, they've also found not only that, but it's actually much cheaper. Um, so that's a double, a double, a double win for them, being more sustainable and and reducing costs, which is especially important right now. Um, yeah, great. Go on to the next one. Um, so yeah, like I said, we've Hacker working them since since this time last year, and they wanted to try and get carbon labels on the on the menu at the same time as the calories to really highlight that. Um, they thought that carbon labels were more important. Uh, and I'm obviously obviously going to agree with that um, um, because I think carbon labels are something that people aren't really aware of. People also go to, to restaurants for, for a treat. And what we've always tried to do with our labels is not kind of criticise people for their choices. We want people to, if they do want to go to Oaxaca and have the, you know, the beef tacos, that they then know that and they then go back and think, okay, now I had the beef, maybe I'll go home and have something more climate friendly because I now know that what those options are. Um, and what we saw with Oaxaca using our tool is they also were quite surprised by, you know, for I think their, 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 their squash tostadas, they had 10 grams of feta in that, which was just really there for a garnish. Um, so by reducing that and taking that off the off the menu, they actually reduced the carbon footprint quite significantly of that dish. Um, so it's just looking at small swaps for that. Um, and by using our our labels and ha having that, adding that, the carbon labels to the dishes, um, they actually won the 2022 QSR Media Awards for Best Sustainability Initiative Award. Um, and we're really happy to work with them on that and help them provide some bespoke communication material to their customers on their website um, before going out with that information. Oh, and the last one is the one I've just talked about, actually. But as you can see on the menus here, this is kind of how it looks at the O2. So um, we have all the different, all the different dishes labelled. Um, and, you know, we also work with them on a COP26 to make sure that dishes had more plant-based options. We did help them design a, a plant-based burger, which was 50% beef, 50% lentils, a bit similar to what Le uh, Vic was saying earlier about just by having cutting that, cutting half of them, making the beef half and half, you're going to really re dramatically reduce the burger without actually impacting the taste um, too much. So yeah, in in uh, in kind of in summary, um, what we try and what we what we want to try and work with different hospitality businesses on is helping you to first of all label your menus and increase the sales of your plants from smart food by using the tool to not only look at where you can make reductions by adding the menus we know and we found that you will you will add add more climate friendly dishes and climate climate friendly sales to your to your menu outlook um we then also help you attract new businesses and new new customers so new businesses if it's say for events or for a conference or new customers if you're kind of appealing to that new sustainably minded generation which are coming through especially you know in the in the gen z generation um by by sharing your progress with your colleagues and with your guests you'll, you'll also encourage more staff retention and more kind of staff to your business and lastly as i said before it's obviously important to just try and take action you know we don't we can't rely on the government or anyone else to act we need businesses to to lead the way with this um because I think otherwise we're going to be living in difficult times. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's basically all that Vic and I had to say. But if anyone's got any any questions for us, we can we're really happy to happy to answer them. Yeah, they never they, no no one ever really asks. Um, but it's always worth a try. Um, yeah, worth a try. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, do you guys want to just uh, say out loud your emails as well, and then I'm sure this will get shared on Airship socials and maybe even Clamato uh, socials. Um, so if anyone does have any questions or thinks of any, um, you can drop myself an email, um, which is ben at airship.co.uk or uh, one of Will's. 
yeah, my mind is just will at clamato.co.uk. Feel free to, yeah, any, anything you want to answer, uh, I can show I can give my best shot. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, well, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, that was really great. I really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you so much for, for hosting and presenting. It's been a long time coming that this has been in the works. So it's nice to, to have gotten it off the ground. Great. Thanks very much, Ben. Great. Wonderful. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Ben.